If you are a highly creative person, you must make things. You have an obligation to create if you can. There is an art in appreciating creativity in others' art. And there are a lot of people who try to force doing something creative when they really should be playing in the creativity of others. You should start with a little thing. I think a trap that a lot of people fall into is like people want to almost start at the end of their idea and you can't start at the end of your idea. There is something that you can choose that is seemingly mundane. Literally everything can have a creative tinge put into it. If you have ideas, you need to do something with them. Just don't let them be forgotten by yourself. You have an obligation to do that. Whatever it is, friggin' do it. Hey, welcome to the Create Unknown, the home of Make Something Mean Something. It is TCU's day. We are here live on Discord because we're always here live on Discord. Actually, we're back from a little bit of a break, a little bit of a Thanksgiving break. I'm feeling, feeling, feeling energized, ready to go. I have a a Coke Zero, so I'm just flying high right now. I'm Kevin Lieber, and with me, as always, is Matthew Tabor. Yeah, we we were allowed to have a little bit of a a holiday for once, and that was they, they let us come out of the salt mines to celebrate Thanksgiving with our families, and that was kind of nice. Um, you've got the the Coke Zero. I've got the best yet diet white birch beer, and it is chilled because because it's chilled in my home. Uh, I've been doing No Heat November. I know Demetrius, who's uh, on Twitter and in the Discord frequently, uh, he was doing No Heat November as well, where we don't turn on our heat at all, uh, not until the end of November. So y- y- you guys can have the the nut thing. I don't know much about that. I don't want to know anything about that. I deal with oil. I deal with petroleum restrictions. And the Wall Street Journal wrote this up. Uh, It was in the November 29th edition. Uh, They called it okay to turn on the heat. Not here. You can see a picture of my thermostat reading, I think, 47 in the living room. But uh, the weather is really mild right now. And it is the 29th. Tomorrow is the last day. I'm not I'm not going to have to turn the heat on tomorrow. It's smooth sailing. This is like the. uh, the Tour de France, how on the last lap, you know, the, the yellow jersey wearer gets to just kind of cruise into the lead in the final lap like that. <laughs> that's that's where that's me right now. I'm, I'm cruising in a uh, really, really chilled, nice environment. It's been good. What is it going to be like when you finally do turn the heat on? And do you have a threshold for which you will not cross? Is there a number? Is there a number in Fahrenheit where you say, you know what? The heat is going on now. Uh not in terms of physical comfort. That's that's okay. The only issue that matters is pipes freezing. And so uh, I, I kind of have to monitor the temperature to make sure I don't get too close to pipes bursting because that is a, a serious problem and it's an expensive problem. Um, and at that point, I would turn the heat on. This is like one of the only rules of No Heat November is that you can put the heat on just enough to keep your pipes from freezing. So if there is a danger of that, I would put the heat on at like 45 and then not worry about it. But um, no, as long as I'm moving, it's completely and totally fine. Uh, being being in the 40s, I mean, you know, I, I dress warmly, like I, I don't run around in my tidy whities, uh, but I, I'm not wearing coats or anything either. You know, I just put a sweatshirt on, that's that. Uh, but yeah, as long as I'm moving, it is completely and totally fine. Uh, that's that's what I realized. I, I stopped. A- actually, Kevin, I was talking to you. Um, you know, we were sitting there for a little while, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. I don't know. And my fingers and toes started to get cold. Uh, that's, that's longer than I, I spend sitting on my own. So, so yeah, the key to getting through no heat November is just keep doing things, keep moving. It sounds like this is is going to be more than no heat November, though. It sounds like it's going to be no heat winter, except for <laughs> emergency situations that definitely will arise as you get into January, February, when it gets freakishly, freakishly yeah. cold. And and for people who don't 
understand what it's like uh, living in cold climates and dealing with a burst pipe. I think that might be number two in terms of like worst thing that could possibly happen in your house. No, number one, probably being like a roof issue, like a roof a, a collapse or oh, hole, sure. uh, like like having a problem with your roof. I would think, I don't know, yeah. some, some uh, construction person listening to this is screaming right now because they have this wrong. But as a layman, I would think number one problem, roof issue. Number two, burst pipe. But I could be wrong. Maybe burst pipe is actually number one. It's a really, it's not good to have water just shooting no. all over your walls. It's a lot of water until yeah. you get it turned off. Yeah, and that's that's a process. I, I will say there are two milestones that matter uh, if, I, if I want to extend here. And the 10 day looks really friendly to me. So I, I think I can go at least that far. There's nothing in there that uh, it makes me think I need to turn it on. The first one is is getting to the, the anniversary of the Battle of the Chosin Reservoir, the Korean War battle that was quite cold. Uh, I think that is uh, ends uh, probably two weeks from now. So getting through that would be great. And then there's a couple day buffer before uh, the anniversary of the Battle of the Bulge, which was also quite cold. So when I think um, cold, rotten December environments, I think of the Chosin Reservoir and the Battle of the Bulge. So that's how we will mark those dates uh, here at the homestead. <laughs> okay. Well, in the meantime, uh, we'll pop a link. We have a, a link in, in the Discord right now to the, to the Wall Street Journal article that features <laughs> Matt Tabor's thermostat with a photo credited to Matt Tabor. It's, it's surreal <laughs> and very hilarious. <laughs> Uh, which before we started recording, uh, we are uh, uh, I've already discussed the need to frame this this article uh, above yep. the actual thermostat, so there'll be a framed photo of the thermostat from the newspaper above the thermostat itself um, as a memorial That's to this moment. Meta. Yeah, That's yeah. Right. But but to yeah, and thank you to Ducky for suggesting that it it kicked off uh, a train of thought that's going to lead to a, just an awesome thing on my wall. <laughs> great things, great things. That's why we share ideas uh, with our community here at the Create Unknown. We are going to share our own ideas, well, mine specifically, because it's my turn to get into the the rules for life. Uh, you had your turn last time. We'll we'll rotate from here on. But this week we have something that popped up for me uh, really recently, uh, as I okay. uh, because I started cartooning again. So oh yes, yes. This is this is new. Uh, for for me, uh, well, not new. It's it's an old thing that I didn't do for a really long time, uh, which is just draw like idiotic cartoons. But Matt, you know, and but but very few people actually know is is that how that's how I got my start doing things creatively oh, um, decades ago. <laughs> yes, yes, decades Literally, ago. Yeah. at this point was and just to like briefly recap, I was. Uh, when I went to college, the school newspaper had a comic section that was run by students. It was not like nationally syndicated comic strips. It was just people who also went to school there. You could draw a comic and submit it to the newspaper and they could print it. And in the same way that years later, I found YouTube to be a revelation where I was like, wait, 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 I can make a video and just strangers can see it anywhere. That's amazing. I thought the same thing with this, with the comics in the newspaper. I was like, whoa, wait, wait, I can just kind of make a comic about almost whatever I want and people will have to look at it. <laughs> like strangers will see this. That's really cool. That's really cool. So I, I do need to interject and remind people that student newspapers really actually mattered back then because you didn't have a, a phone to sit and waste time on. So it was really common for people to sit in class and you know go through the the student newspaper or in the bathroom to kill time so they wouldn't have to go back to class. People actually read the student newspaper. Uh, there was just no alternative. So when when Kevin says you could you could reach people by doing this, uh, yeah, the people on your campus uh, were actually looking at it. That's a point I hadn't even considered. Yeah, there were no smartphones at this point. So the the big place no. that, that the newspaper got a lot of reading was uh, the cafeteria because you could grab it on your way into the cafeteria and then you can look at it while you ate lunch. So the the all the cafeterias at school were just had, you know, were littered with these newspapers. So 
that was the first creative thing that I did on any sort of scale. Oh, the first creative thing that I did where, you know, strangers, strangers were having to look at a thing that I made. And I did that for, for many, many years throughout my experience at college. And then I did it for a while afterwards. And then YouTube came along and I made videos full time. And that's basically been the last like 12 years of my life nearly until recently. And there's a reason for that. And it has to do with this rule. So the, the rule is that um, if you are a highly creative person, you must make things. You, you have an obligation to create if you can. And there are two phrases that go along with this. This, this is specific, though, to creative people. And I can kind of go further into my thought process with all of this. But real quick, there are two phrases that are uh, very well known that are really similar. One comes from Spider-Man. And the Spider-Man quote is, with great power comes great responsibility. Now, a little bit before Spider-Man's time, there was the Bible. Uh, for any Bible aficionados out there, uh, there's a line that says, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. And I'm essentially spinning off these two phrases into specifically the creative domain because I recognized I, sh I, I need to draw stupid cartoons. I need to do that because I can. Uh, even if I'm not the greatest artist or the funniest person, it's still something that I have the ability to do and others don't. So there is a, a bit of a, a calling almost to not waste that, to not ignore that, to not say, eh, it doesn't matter. You know, life goes on <laughs> whether or not I draw a potato with a mustache. It's like, okay, maybe it does. But at the same time, I, ha I noticed right out of the gate when I posted stuff, uh, these cartoons, people kind of crawling out of the woodwork, people I haven't heard from in in those two decades, thrilled to see just new stupid drawings from me. And that really meant a lot to me. It was like, oh, wow, like these people remembered that this was something that I could do and they're just happy to see it again. And that that means a lot to me to be able to do that. This is this is a really interesting concept because uh, the the quotes that you pulled are really about an obligation to be creative when you have creativity in you. But then there are all these questions about it. Uh, is the obligation to you yourself? What you described with with the cartoons, you know, it's almost like you you owed it to yourself to do this again, and you felt quite good once you you started again. And then there's a the question of are you obligated uh, morally or otherwise to to provide other people with 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 your creative uh, creative talent? Um, there are a lot of different directions, and it seems like it seems like everyone has an argument that supports it. Um, I, as you were talking, the, the classic example popped into my head with Aristotle about flutes. And the question is who should, who should get the best flutes? Uh, and he explains who should and, and shouldn't get them. It's, it's not who can afford them. Uh, it's not, um, you know, it's not uh, the ones who are going to enjoy it the most. He thought that, uh, the purpose is, is what mattered. And that, that's the, the telos, uh, conceptually. And so if the purpose of a flute is to to have music played from it, then the best flute player should should have the flute. Um it's kind of, it's kind of similar here where uh the people who are going to use the talent should should have the best talent. Uh and we see people get angry when it doesn't work out that way. You know, they they get they get annoyed and bummed when they see people wasting talent. You know, everybody feels bad about that. You know somebody, and maybe you are that person with with some talent. I I am, uh, where you can do something, and for one reason or another, you don't. Well, you feel bad about yourself when there's a mismatch there. So, so I like the direction, Kevin, that you're going with this. Yeah, I I think wasted potential is something that everyone. It's a concept that everyone feels and has as some sort of relation to. And it doesn't have to be wasted potential in regards to a creative endeavor. It could be any number of of different 
directions that that can occur. But this is specifically about a creative direction because that's what I have experience with. So I feel comfortable talking about this because I have a lot of experience to draw from in my own life, ups and downs along the way. Uh, one of the things that, well, well, let me let me address one thing that you you said first, and that's okay, and that's uh, whether it's important, whether I owe it to myself or I owe it to other people. Hmm. I had thought I hadn't thought about whether I owed it to myself. That wasn't how I was thinking of it. I was distinctly thinking of it as I owe this to other people. Like I owe sharing. And and look, I'm not curing cancer and I'm not claiming to be doing that. That's not what this is. But I felt as though I do owe other people five seconds of joy that they that they wouldn't have gotten otherwise. And, and it doesn't have to be a lot of people. It could be five people. If there are five people who get five seconds of joy, there's a total of 25 seconds of joy uh, created, manifested from like a terrible drawing of the angry video game nerd. That's a win. That's a win. <laughs> I'm happy about that. And I think that I have an obligation to do that because I can, because I'm happy I'm healthy. I have the ability. I'm alive. <laughs> like I'm checking a lot of boxes here. Yeah. Uh, uh, in terms of conditions for creating something here, and I just realized it's a mistake to ignore that stuff and to just ah I'll just watch another episode of whatever show I'm currently hooked on. It's like okay, pause the show. It'll still <laughs> it'll still be there. Spend 25 yeah. minutes doing a thing spend 10 minutes doing a thing that maybe other people can't do and they appreciate your talents and then go back to your show. And that that's really worth a lot, I think, in the long run. It's kind of everything, I think, in the long run. I don't know. I like to think of extreme examples on this stuff to see how they how they play with, with the rule, you know? And um, imagine that there was like a heart surgery or brain surgery or something. That only you could do. You're the only person in the world who has the ability and the knowledge to perform this life-saving surgery. Um, you don't have to do it. I mean, nobody's going to make you perform surgery at gunpoint uh, over and over and over. But wouldn't you feel a, a moral obligation to save as many people's lives as possible? Uh, you, you have this talent. There's a use to other people that's, that's important for that talent, you would grind yourself out uh, doing surgery after surgery for anybody who needed it. And if you like, how would you live with yourself when you're like, ah, you know, I'd rather watch the Simpsons tonight. And you know that the consequences of that, it's like somebody dying because they didn't get their surgery from you in time. Uh, that would be, that would be pretty tough to, to justify. Uh, but then you get into this territory where it's like, okay, is that person, because of this moral obligation, whether it's a surgery or whether it's just bringing five seconds of joy through something creative, to what degree are they obligated to continue to provide that? Uh, and I, I'm sure that's one of those continuums where there's no stopping point. Uh, but is, you know, it, it's uh, that meme where it's like, do the thing, do the thing, and, you know, poking something with a stick. Like if somebody is a one hit wonder with an amazing song, do they have to trot themselves out in bars and third rate casinos every night of their life until their last breath singing, you know, whatever the hell their number one song was like, uh, Cherry I, don't, pie. I, I don't know. <laughs> well, they had, they had more than one song. I'd like, I'd like to, uh, Blue, I saw red is quite pie. Good. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, their next album went into cakes and cookies and all sorts of uh, decadent edibles. Delic delicacies. Yeah, just trying to re recapture the magic of cherry pie. Uh, that's That scone song yeah, so, really wasn't very good. So I think there is absolutely an obligation there, whether it's drawing a comic or whether it is uh, uh, making a meme. Charles Kahn is saying that drawing, you know, little cartoons uh, – led to him doing meme stuff now. And I believe that completely. Um, yeah, there's an obligation there, but how strong is that obligation? That's my question. Yeah. 
Well, I think it is a continuum, and, and, and certainly, certainly, there are a lot of factors at play uh, depending upon you know where you are in your life and and sort of what what's most important to you at, at that time. If there's tragedy going on, there, there are any number of factors that could play into this. I, I think I'm coming at from coming at it from a place of um, like if you're at zero, get to one, and you know if you're at one, then consider getting at getting to two. Um, I think zero. Sucks. Like unless unless you really have to be at zero when it comes to having the time, energy, health, or whatever it is to to do what you do and and do uniquely and well. Like barring those situations, like serious situations, I think for the most part, like zero sucks. Zero zero is not a good place to be if zero you have the bad. ability. Yeah. Uh, because because there's another part of this that I wanted to get into, uh, which is something that took me. A really long time to learn because um, it's something that you kind of, it's hard to learn on your own. And that is not everyone is highly creative for, for whatever reason yeah, we, we are told we are like lied to <laughs> all of our lives that everyone is creative. You hear this all the time. And, and I felt that throughout at least my sort of formative years and throughout school that like ah oh, school yeah everyone you know ev everybody is a, a budding genius and if they're not there yet it's inside of them well that that's probably not true and there's nothing wrong with that at all uh that's the the lie that i don't like is is that the implication is is that if if you're not some creative genius you're you know some lesser dullard of a being i'm like no it doesn't work that way well, yeah, or even if you don't have like a blazing IQ that you're like a bad person, like, no, that doesn't work that way either. That has not like no. intelligence has nothing to do Ridiculous. Yeah, with the, your, your value as a person. So uh, there, there's no correlation there. But when it comes to creativity in particular, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe, you know, certain people uh, listening to this grew up in different environments in, in which you, you were made to feel special in this regard. Uh, perhaps you went to a like an art school or art private academy. I don't know, but then but then you literally are probably surrounded by people who are all highly creative. I don't know. It seems like there's just it's difficult. It's a difficult thing to understand when you are someone who is highly creative, and it's not something that I was ever told, and I didn't know about myself. And uh, and and first of all, I didn't know it about myself because I only knew how to think the way that I think. I don't know how other people think. How could I possibly? I don't understand <laughs> yeah. how other people think. I only know how I think. So the way that I think turns out to be highly creative. It, 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 it's I don't know the science of it. I've tried to re read about it, but the science on creativity kind of blows. But essentially, the way that I think... It's pretty, it, pretty hokey stuff. Most of the time. Yeah, it's not useful, but... I can have ideas and I can have a lot of them and I can have them quickly and they can be weird. And sometimes I think that they're great. And the next day I think that they suck. But the fact is, is that I have the ability to generate ideas at a pretty rapid pace and not only generate them, but uh, discern like pros and cons of them, uh, make decisions about ways to tweak them. I can just process that very naturally and always have been have been able to but growing up i just figured everybody thought that way because how how would i know how someone else thinks it's, yeah. it's impossible but they don't think that way yeah. and no one in school ever pointed out to me like hey like kevin i have noticed that you're one of the most creative people like in your class that was never a thing yeah. ever no one says that nobody ever did that no no no, no. and well, and it's hard to recognize too. It's really hard. And if uh, you know, we we have enough time and space that that a lot of other people don't have, where we can think back to something twenty five years ago with like a big data set of people. Like, not to make it too clinical, but we can think back to literally hundreds of people we knew twenty five years ago, and what the impressions uh, we had of them and what other people had of them were like. And now we can we can see what they do. And some people, it was it was obvious that they were artistic or creative or something like that. And there's no surprise uh, that that they made a living out of it. Now um, there are others where 
where it's like, yeah, you had no idea that this guy was, a, you know, an incredible cartoonist or musician or something like that. It's such an, a weird, inexact science. I don't know what you've been sipping, but you've got it all wrong. It's time to commit to the leaf. We've embraced the smoothness and surprising pick-me-up that tea provides. I literally drink it all day long, nearly a gallon a day, and it powers me through research, script writing, and forums on websites that I refuse to name here. But we don't drink normie NPC tea. We drink cultured and refined anime tea from the Dragon's Treasure. Kevin still likes the gunpowder green called Space Cowboy, and I've sampled nearly 40 Dragon's Treasure teas at this point. Lately, I've been slamming black teas like Kentucky Bourbon and Liquefied Berserk Despair. Scottish Breakfast is deep and peaty, and I smooth it over with Sebastian's Morning Earl Grey, which has the best vanilla cream taste I think I've ever had in a cup. Give me a pot of that with a hot meatball sub from Sal's Pizza and Brooks Barbecue Chicken to wash down my last meal on death row. I highly recommend the sampler pack you'll want to try everything just like I did. I literally have not had one tea that I wouldn't be happy to reorder. The Dragon's Wings membership fuels new tea experimentation, and the Tea of the Month Club provides a regularly scheduled surprise. And when you order from the Dragon's Treasure using code CREATE, you'll get 10% off your order. That's 10% off using the code CREATE at thedragonstreasure.com. The link's in the description. Um, but I, I want to hit something that popped in the episode chat before I ask you a question, Kevin. And, and that is Andy saying, uh, I got to scroll up to see exactly what he said. Oh, he's saying it, me not being super creative is my one weakness. And it's frustrating because he wants to make stuff, but can't sometimes. There is absolutely an art in appreciating creativity in others' art. Uh, that is a thing. Um, you don't have to be the one, you know, yanking the wheel. You don't have to be in the driver's seat all the time on everything creative. It's extremely useful not to be. Think about somebody like Rick Beato. How much time do you think he spent constructing music versus how much time he spent listening to music? <laughs> the ratio has to be shocking in the favor of him appreciating other creativity. That is a thing. That is awesome. That is absolutely not any kind of weakness. And there are a lot of people who, who really try to force uh, doing something creative when, when they really should be playing in the creativity of others. That's a great place to be. And so if, if you're somebody, you get this all the time where somebody wants to do something that for whatever reason, they're not built for. You know, Kevin, you talked in the past about how uh, at one point you would have loved to play in the NBA. This is... Uh, not in in the cards for you in terms of DNA and, and other things. It just wasn't a fit. The likelihood of you being an NBA player is is low. Imagine what your life would be if you never accepted that, you never acknowledged it, and you spent you know, 25, 30 years training to be in the NBA when it, it really wasn't going to happen. You know, I, I like a lot of things. I, I like baseball to that degree. You know, I was not built uh, and, and don't have all sorts of talents necessary to be a properly competitive baseball player. Well, wouldn't it be kind of sad if I'd spent 20 years training to be a baseball player and just sucking at baseball? <laughs> <laughs> like that's weird. No. So instead I got into all of these elements of baseball as a fan. That's really cool. You can appreciate other people's talent and immerse yourself in that talent without banging your head against a wall to do it. Um, so, so yeah, that, that is just not a weakness. There's a whole thing there. But my question, Kevin, for you is uh, how did you decide that your creative obligation here was these cartoons? Because there's any range of things that you could have done. You've talked about music in the past. Uh, you could have picked up a guitar and, and, and played around with that and felt really good. You could have made some songs that people could hear. Uh, there are all manners of creative things. You could have talked about UFC. You know, you, you, you talk to uh, uh, Sumido Media about UFC uh, now and again, and you could make something people would really enjoy about that. Instead, you're drawing these little cartoons. So how did how did how did that get to be the result? Well, I, I don't want to suggest that there was some sort of master plan behind that. 
uh, you know, part part of it has been, and this is <laughs> kind of a funny thing, is that I, I doodle a lot during these recordings while we're doing the podcast. I ha- I have sheets of paper that I print out often with, you know, topic starters and maybe some information on the guests that we're interviewing. And I usually doodle on these. So I have been drawing for the last few years just on scraps of podcast paper, basically, and just recently realized like, oh, this is really fun. And I like doing it. Um, It's not a huge, I don't have a lot of time to like write and record music or anything like that would be kind of like a lot of uh, a lot of time to carve out for. But to draw a thing, it takes, you know, it takes me like 15 minutes to come up with an idea, draw the thing, scan it and put it on the internet. And like, I have time for that. So I'm going to do that. And I think it's funny. I don't know. I like to, a lot. I, I think every sort of almost every people person that we've interviewed and nearly every se- successful creative person, I think mostly they do the thing because they want to see it made. Like they didn't see anybody else doing it. So they'll do it sort of thing. And that's a little bit of what I do with my drawings. It's like, I have some stupid idea that I think is funny. Like some guy with a gigantic mustache yelling that his grandpa gave him, <laughs> gave him that mustache. Like that to me is very funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, so I want to draw that and, and that that's really all there is to it on that front. But it's, uh, but thinking about it as something that I should be doing changed recently. Like I hadn't thought about it like that before. And it, and it was a little shocking and, you know, I never regret things, but one thing I regret is stopping drawing for like 10 years. Like I should not have done that. And that's a little bit also why I want to make this podcast is because, man, once I started drawing again, one of the people that came out of the woodwork that I was talking to was a guy from high school who was the most amazing artist that I ever knew personally, just could draw whatever came out of his head perfectly. It was amazing. It was like magic to me. Like I couldn't believe that he could draw this stuff. And I reconnected with him after having not spoken to this dude in, I don't know how long, like 22 years. And he told me that he had also just started drawing again after not doing it at all for like 15 years. And I'm like, okay, so this is like the most talented artist I've ever known personally stopped drawing completely for a decade and a half. Uh, I am not the most talented person drawing, but I could come up with stupid ideas that have minimal value, but enough that I think they're worth doing. And I stopped for, you know, 12 plus years. This is stupid. Long time. It, yeah. it kind of made me upset. <laughs> I was like, this is stupid. And if, if we can create a podcast, if I could create a rule to nip this in the bud for anybody out there who stopped doing the thing that they're good at, that they're uniquely special to create and a few other people liked get back on that horse. Like just start doing that again because you really should. You really should. And I think everybody feels better when they do this kind of thing. Um, And I think it can be tiny too. It can be mundane. It doesn't have to be super art. So, so here's an example. Um, I'm going to do a shout to, to my brother. It's his his, uh, 50th birthday today, but he recently started a YouTube channel because, uh, (laughs) I don't know the word to describe this because it's not saying like one of his passions, but a thing he really, really enjoys is finding golf balls. Okay. Uh, he likes finding the golf balls that go into, uh, the, the lakes and water traps and things like that, that are mishit. Uh, some of them are crummy golf balls and some of them are very nice golf balls and he likes washing them and, and, uh, getting them ready to, return to players you know he'll sell them to to people who who want a particular type of ball anyway uh, he started filming this a little bit and put him on youtube and uh, he's got a few subscribers that's good but he he told me the other night that he'd hit a hundred hours of watch time it's like well how many uh, how many hours uh, have you spent on this channel and he didn't know how many but he knew it was a lot less than a hundred like okay this is something that we talked about with william osman a really long time ago where you've taken X number of hours of, of creativity and generated, you know, much more than that number uh, in happiness for the world. That's amazing. That's really good. 
And I, I think he feels good about this. I didn't ask him about it, but I, I think that uh, when you realize that uh, that you've done that, uh, it, it's it's a really big deal society wide. It's the kind of thing nobody measures, nobody can measure. Uh, but that's that's just kind of how it all works, right? <laughs> Where uh, all sorts of people are doing their own thing. Whether it's uh, fixing cars or doing something creative that uh, that benefits everybody else, uh, and then you get those personal benefits too, where you know you, you feel good about doing the thing that you enjoy doing. Uh, all of this makes makes a lot of sense, and I think that uh, this this leads into my my next question for you, Kevin: is how do you find how do you find the thing that that you should do and focus on because the truth is that most people aren't like uniquely the best at, at anything. I'm certainly not. Uh, I haven't been the best at anything ever. Um, I've been pretty good at a couple things, uh, but if I didn't do them, the world wouldn't change. Uh, they, they were hit or miss like that. Uh, I started doing some stuff with wood and uh, did a stream on Twitch the other night where I, I deprimed some uh, 45 caliber brass because I, I like playing around with, uh, with with cleaning ammunition and things like that. So uh, you can do do those little things, um, but but how do you find out what that is? Well, I think you should you should start with a little thing. I think a, a trap that a lot of people fall into is they're like, all right, I'm going to create this whole thing, but first I need to get this, and I need to you know redesign this room for it, and I need to you know and this is something that we we got into with um, um, Niles Red a little bit where he would get this from from people wanting to start making chemistry videos and they'd be like all right what should i buy i have oh, yeah. like two thousand dollars and he's like dude just buy you know yeah. like some dixie cups and you know white vinegar and you, know, you don't start with uh, right, like three right. two grand worth of like chemistry set um just start small so definitely starting small i think is really important because uh, people want to almost start at the end of their idea and you can't start at the end of your idea you just start no. at the beginning of your idea and then work your way and eventually yeah. you there is no end really um i mean there, there will be like mortally but as long as you're on like the creative journey uh it is a journey so so i think that that's a good place to start is like what can you do that wouldn't be really expensive or a huge you know renovation of some sort needs to occur and whatever off well first i gotta you know yeah. divorce my wife and abandon my kids it's like okay maybe don't do that <laughs> <laughs> maybe don't maybe don't do that how committed are you yeah, yeah right if you're not yeah. doing that first i have to break out of jail and then okay well we have other problems to solve <laughs> first you know but i i also want to say really quick that this is I, I, like really, I mean this dedicated to highly creative people because they are special. And if you are a highly creative person and no one's ever told you that you were special before, then let me tell you, you are special. It's rare. It's as rare as dunking a basketball. I know I made that analogy before, but like not a lot of people can dunk a basketball. Not a lot of people are highly creative and just can come up with tons of ideas all the time. I didn't, I literally did not figure that out. No one told me. I eventually figured it out by like my third year of, of college <laughs> after class, yeah. after class, after class, where I was the person who always came up with the idea in my group project, not because I'm a tyrant. I'm far from a tyrant. I mean, Matt, you know how I am. And, and You're the anti-tyrant. Yeah, like, you know how I am socially yeah. and in group settings. Like, I'm not trying to dominate uh, any social setting. I sit back and I listen. And in all of those, no one else had any ideas. I, I don't mean bad ideas. I mean none. They would all just look at each yeah. other and just say, I don't know. I don't know. Like, what should we do? I don't know. And eventually... I would be like, okay, why don't we do like um, a spaceship themed like like magical potato chip that the can <laughs> the can is shaped like a rocket and it's like uh, it has caffeine in it, so it's like a caffeine potato chip and there's like a monkey in a spacesuit on the cover. Like that's what I do. I could just do that yeah. off the top of my head. I'll come up with like eight different ideas. 
<laughs> like instantly. And everyone just looks at me like I'm insane. And they're like, okay, we'll do, let's just do that. Cause nobody else has an idea. And that happened over and over and over again to the point where I was like, okay, this is a unique thing. And it's probably worth recognizing that. Yeah. And it's, it's unfortunate that you had to go through that process. Uh, it, it took you a long time to realize that. And, you know, it's similar with, with me where the, um, you know, the stuff that I did, it was just stuff I did. And I didn't realize that other people didn't do all that stuff until I, I met other people and they didn't do all that stuff. (laughs) 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 So, so here's an example. Um, so my dad was, uh, he, he worked for, the succession of companies that is now Verizon, you know, started out as uh, Ma Bell before that. That was Bell System was broken up. Uh, the monopoly was into the New York Telephone, and then Nine X, and then Bell Atlantic, and then then Verizon. Uh, so I knew basic stuff about phone wiring, and I went to uh, a summer thing that was long enough uh, to where we could have uh, landlines in our building. Well. We were all like 16 and nobody had any money and nobody really wanted to pay a monthly phone bill just to occasionally get a phone call from their parents. Uh, so, so I, I opened up the, the jack in the wall and then just ran wire, uh, to everybody's room and then ran it to the uh, apartment across you know and put something over the wire so nobody would trip on them and and hooked up like nine phones to one line and then we split the the $20 cost uh that you know nobody else was doing that um that was a skill that i when i realized like oh uh, i can look at the the red and black and yellow and green wires and know what to do here whereas the other people that i'm living with right now can't do that um I, I just, I didn't know, you know, I didn't know that was a, a unique skill at that time, you know, until we all had our phones for free, you know, it was a janky setup, but you know, I was 16, like <laughs> it, it wasn't meant to be heirloom construction. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think, you know, Kevin, you, you speak about the, the highly creative people and we know so, so many of them, uh, from guests to patrons, to discord members, to, to, to friends on Twitter. We know a lot of them. I want to shoot a quick message to the zeros and the zilches uh, with, with their creative heads barely above the muddy, swampy morass of creativity. The zilches and the zeros, uh, who th- that's roughly where I am in terms of uh, artistic talent and creativity. You can be creative. There is something that you can choose and enjoy that is seemingly mundane. Okay. Think about cooking. Uh, every time you make anything, you can be a little bit of a weirdo with whatever's in your fridge. You'd be like, Oh, I I would never, uh, I I would never think to squirt this on my steak, but let me try it. (laughs) And then all of a sudden, uh, you've put together something that probably nobody else in the world has ever done. And even if they've done something with the same ingredients, it's not in the, the same amounts. Uh, the ingredients are not aged exactly the same. There's a unique combination of uh, whatever your experience is with that thing. So you don't need to be uh, some incredible painter or be able to craft a super strange narrative on YouTube like somebody like Oki can. Uh, Yeah, you can just do it in your kitchen or you can just come up with, with an efficient way to rake your leaves. I mean, that's why I talk about that stuff. I approach the mundane, normal things in the same way that Kevin's talking about approaching the creative things, because that's, that's where my life is. You know, I, I like, uh, figuring out efficiency on how much I can fit in my car. (laughs) I did this the other day and I was really happy about it. Like it made my day to fit 18 five gallon buckets in my Impreza <laughs> when a police officer told me that I would have to make three trips of six. I'm like, absolutely not. You know, I was polite about it. I'm like, no, I'm going to do this. Um, you know, that's, that's creative thinking. You know, what is the absolute most efficient path to your mailbox? Have you ever thought about that? There has to be 
a number of steps that is just a perfect beeline where you're not going to step in a puddle or, you know, otherwise ruin your shoes. There's, there's a perfect way to get the mail. Literally everything can have a creative, like, little tinge put into it. So it just doesn't have to be art that is going to be uh, appreciated by millions. It, it can literally be like, yep, I squirted that on a steak and it was absolutely horrible, but I just did something creative. And next time I'm going to try something that I think works a little bit better. So yeah, the opportunities are there for literally everybody. Well, I was going to, first of all, the bucket story is true because I got, I heard all about that yesterday. So anybody who's yeah, doubting- Tabor's bucket story, that is 100% true. I saw the pictures of the, of these buckets. Yeah, and I will point out that I locked myself out of the car, <laughs> like not not being able to start the car because there is so much weight in it that it, it locked up the, the steering uh, column and I, I couldn't do it. So I had to take five of the buckets out, start my car, uh, make sure it would run, and then put the five buckets back in before I drove home. It was awesome. Yeah, it's funny that it, that it would then, it didn't shut off. Once it was running, it was okay with the weight, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. We want to help you make something and mean something. And we say that phrase all the time because when you're making something and you know it means something, even if it's just to you, that's when you feel pretty good about what you're creating. The support for the Create Unknown in recent weeks has been incredible. Animators, artists, musicians, YouTubers, aspiring filmmakers, comedians, it is crazy how talented everybody in this community is. Consider joining the Create Unknown Patreon. Every dollar that comes through goes straight into the podcast and its community. That means more highlights videos. It means a big Minecraft project that's on the way. And eventually we'd like to manufacture custom piss bottles so you never have to leave your battle station. And being a patron unlocks participation in all of our live recordings. You've seen the roster of guests we've had. Having access to their minds is a unique opportunity. You can go to patreon.com slash thecreateunknown or click the link that's in the description. Every little bit helps and your support means absolutely everything to us. Patreon.com slash thecreateunknown. Links in the description. We appreciate you, Space Cowboys. But, okay. So, I said earlier, this is specifically for like highly creative rare people i will now let other people into this by stating another thing that people don't like to talk about but let's talk about it and that's that everybody is different and does have different skills like that's another thing that i don't know that bothers me that we try to do at least in kind of like the public school system is just flatten everyone like oh everybody's the same it's like well first of all no and second of all that sucks I don't know who thinks that's, you know, <laughs> an awesome <laughs> Nobody, thing because yeah. it's not. Like, nobody actually thinks it either. No. no. No sane person thinks that everybody is the same. No, it's ridiculous. And it's self-evident, like, as soon as you look around and you notice, like, hey, those, like, three people seem to get A pluses a lot more than these three people. It's like, maybe something's different here. Or, hey, this guy is really good at gym class and, and you know, this guy is really not. It's like, yeah. Like these things sort of sort themselves selves out quickly. But my point is that, you know, Andy from from the baby gang mentioned earlier that he's upset that, you know, he, he is disappointed that he's not as creatively successful as he hopes to be. Meanwhile, this guy flies airplanes like he's an he <laughs> he's, is literally a pilot. He's literally a pilot. <laughs> you can fly airplanes. Yeah. Guess what? That's amazing. <laughs> That's absolutely amazing. There are not a whole lot of people on planet Earth that can fly an airplane. And that's something no. that you should be incredibly proud of. That's way cooler than drawing a potato. Flying <laughs> a plane is way cooler. It's higher on the list of like, uh, you know, benefits to humanity overall than drawing a huge mustache on a skinny, skinny old man. So, yeah. And Imagine if you could go back in time and ask people to analyze you in your life. Uh, Andy, if you went to, to I don't know, like uh, medieval era, middle ages, something like that, and say, well, uh, well, number one, I, I can pull this uh, or appreciate other people pulling this metal out of the ground and then separating it from the rock and the dirt and then forging it into something that I can use. And if we put it together this way, even though this weighs uh, as much as your house, I can actually get this in the air 
uh, and, and take it to wherever I want and do that safely for uh, a relatively cheap investment. Do you think that if humanity a thousand years ago would have thought that was a creative endeavor? <laughs> yes, probably. They, I mean, you would have been burned at the stake for being like a, a witch or wizard. Uh, it, it wouldn't have worked out for you. It, but literally all of humanity would be in awe of you harnessing creativity uh, to, to do what you do. And I think that uh, pretty much everybody we know has something in their life where, yeah, they're, they're a little bit of a creative wizard, even though they don't associate it with being creative because it's not like I'm drawing on paper artistic. Yeah, I'm glad you said harnessing because there's a difference. Like he didn't invent the airplane but that's fine. Yeah. We are like someone else already did that. We don't, what we need are pilots <laughs> and you are a great one. And that is a huge, you have a huge role to play in taking people around the world. And that is just as, you know, it's more important really than what I'm talking about. But either way, the same rule really does apply. What would suck a lot is being a great pilot and then not doing anything with it and just saying like, eh, I mean, this doesn't mean that like if you hate doing it, then you should against your will. But at the same time, it's like it's really not such a bad idea to take like a little bit of pride, like a healthy amount of pride in being unique in a way, having a skill that other people don't have, that very few people have, but utilizing it. And again, it just bothered me recently thinking about, you know, selfishly my own life of what I felt was wasting a, a, an easy thing that I could have been doing this whole time that would have been fun. And it would have been like, I like going back. See, see part of having this broken brain is that I forget things really easily. So I'll come up with ideas, but I'll forget them almost as quickly as I conjured them. So it's fun for me to go back and look at old things that I've made because it's like seeing them for the first time. And I'm missing out on, so, so when you said earlier, like, you know, I'm letting myself, am I letting myself down by not doing this or am I letting other people down? And I said, well, I feel like I'm letting other people down because it's something that they don't have the talent to do. So they don't do it. And I do, and I, and, and I don't do it. And that sucks. I also let myself down by not doing it for these last 10 years. Cause now I don't have like a nice fun little archive to scroll through of, what potentially could have been, you know, hundreds of these little drawings or comics or ideas, ideas of which I probably had in my head. Oh yeah, and they're gone. I never, never did anything of with great them. ideas. Thousands of really good ones that that never got made. Uh, one reason I love Weird Paul is because Weird Paul has made or done something out of pretty much every thought he's ever had in his life. Uh, if you listen to the episode we did with him. You'd get that sense if you follow him on Twitter. Yeah, it, it really is a thing. So it, December rolls around and he starts posting. I think it's Peanuts. Uh, one of the papers and newspapers in Pittsburgh put out a Peanuts comic or something like that uh, uh, every single day up until Christmas in 1980 something. Well, Paul thought this would be a really cool thing for posterity and saved all of those comics. And now he's able to do. The, the 25 days before Christmas, uh, a comic each day, uh, just like they did in the 80s. Like, that's cool. He just did it. He has a tremendous body of of creative stuff because uh, he has that 40 year archive. You know, it's it's I, I really struggle with. Um, well, I don't struggle with it. I, feel, I just plain feel bad that I didn't do any woodworking type stuff for nearly 20 years. I'm really happy doing stuff around the house now because it employs those skills. I like making things and uh, and all of that. And I feel like an idiot for doing none of it for so long. Uh, that was a waste. Uh, if I'd done just a little bit of it here and there, I wouldn't have to do a tremendous amount of work on my house right now. <laughs> I would live in a palace because <laughs> I would have knocked out 10 projects a year and over however many years uh, had you know hundreds of projects done. Uh, yeah, get on it. Get on it. Don't 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 put it off for ten or twelve years or twenty or whatever it is. Uh, like, eh, I don't know. I will load up uh, this anything from this list of distractions instead. And there are so many now. There's so many good things to watch. So many good games to play. Uh, and you've got to 
you've got to be a consumer of, of creative stuff to do anything creatively. It's like that Rick Beato example. Uh, but uh, it's not an either or thing. There's something you are somewhere on this slider of making and, and consuming and everybody's in a different place on that slider, but it shouldn't be at zero or 100. It should not be all of one or all of the other. Move that slider somewhere that's appropriate for you and your interests and your happiness and your talents. Find the spot on the slider and, and then just, just hang there, just hang there and have a happy life. Well, and real, I know we have a couple of questions, but real quick, I want to mention that this nests so perfectly with your rule from the previous episode, which is you are what you do because, because well, you have to do something <laughs> to be, you are what you do. So mm -hmm. when I did post those cartoons for the first time in, I don't, I don't whatever, uh, 15 years, the people who were excited about that remembered me as that. Like they remembered me as that guy. Yeah. They're, I'm not a Vsauce guy to them. They don't care about that. They do not care about Vsauce at all. No. Zero. They don't watch it. I don't know how much YouTube they watch. They don't care. I'm not that guy. The guy that I am to them, the I am what you are what you do person that they know draws stupid cartoons. So it was almost like, oh man, it was reborn. almost like being reborn. It was like, I'm back to yeah. these people. It's like, yeah. whoa, that's a weird feeling. And it shouldn't, I shouldn't have let it get to that. I shouldn't have let it get to that. That's a really important thing for people to realize too, that you have to understand that what other people think of you and who you are is almost never who you think you are. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, sometimes it's bad. Uh, but generally it's something like Kevin just said, where they just have an association with you or something about you that resonates with them. That's how they file. That is, they file that's, you that's in their brain. Yeah. 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 And you can't control that. Uh, and you also don't know what it is. Uh, it was um, Kevin. It sounds like it was a surprise to you that people thought of you as the cartoon guy when, when you came back, You're like you wouldn't have thought that's what they thought of you. Well, it was. And if you come up with uh, a paragraph about your life, if you ask 50 people you've encountered to write a paragraph about your life, it's, it's just not going to look like yours. So there's a lot of value in those things that, um, that other people appreciate. Uh, and again, occasionally it's like a negative judgment, but generally not. No, no, it's, uh, it's something positive. It's something that they think is unique about you that you take for granted yourself. Uh, that's, a, that's a hugely important thing. Yeah, I like the way that you put that. Yeah, it's something that they like about you that maybe you don't like about you nearly as much as they do. And that's like yes, a do. weird yeah. imbalance to try to, I don't know, sort of parse in your own head. But the point of this rule is to be conscientious of this and that this exists and that you have the power to do something about it. And you should. Mm -hmm. So yep. um, I hope that this resonated with some people. Even if, it, even if it's one person, that's awesome. Get one person back, back on the horse, riding whatever horse right. that you are skilled and uniquely equipped to ride. It would be a good thing that you did for everyone and the people around you who love you. So that's what this rule is about. You have an obligation. If you have a talent, if you have a skill, if you have a unique perspective, you have an obligation to get it out there and, uh, you know, don't let it be forgotten. Not while you're around, not while you have some, not, not while you can do something about it. There'll be plenty yeah. of time to be you know, forgotten later. Like, you know, don't let it happen and there are now. Times, there are times when you hit a point where you cannot do a thing that you like uh, because right. of uh, life circumstances or physical circumstances. You know, I, I used to love uh, writing things by hand. I, I was very proud of my handwriting. You know, my, my fingers and hands have been destroyed to the point where I can only hold a pen and write properly for like 20 or 30 seconds. Uh, I, I just can't do that the way I used to. And that was a simple little thing that I loved. And now, you know, I, I can do like a gift tag that I'm proud of. <laughs> you know? But at, to give you a sense of how much I like this, at one point, uh, I was going to take a book and transcribe it by hand. That's That would have been fine. Well, guess what? I never got around to that for whatever reasons. And now there is absolutely no way I could ever, ever do that. 
I could probably do one sentence a day and not finish the book I'd want before I was dead. Well, I can't do it anymore, and I blew it. Uh, so yeah, don't don't blow it, which is generally good advice anyway. Um, we've got a couple questions. Do you want to do those, Kevin? Are we ready for those? Yeah, yeah. What are they? Okay. Well, before the, the two questions, I want to point to a comment that Ducky made in the episode chat. He said, you have to do something to make something that means something. And that is that is absolutely right. We've said for years now, actually years, uh, that everybody needs to make something and mean something. Yeah. Well, uh, to, to get to that point, you got to just do something. And that's how the making something and meaning something tends to happen. Mm -hmm. So I like the way these rules are intertwining with uh, with some of the themes over the years. Um, on the questions, the first one is from Dan the Latch, uh, who is himself creative in film. Uh, he brings back to a, a, a quote from Jose Arroyo. Uh, when we talked to him, Jose said, "Your ideas are disposable." How does how does that sentiment from Jose? mesh into today's discussion it meshes perfectly it meshes 100 percent perfectly because to me disposable doesn't mean you don't do anything with them disposable means you make them and move on to the next one and some will be better than others and some maybe will be great one out of 100 will be amazing and the other 99 will be <laughs> on some sort of <laughs> per Pareto distribution of goodness to badness but di disposable does not mean forget them because that's what will happen if you do nothing with them, right? If you don't do anything with the idea, then it's just a fart in your brain. Disposable means you make the thing and then move on. You know, it's like if you have a disposable camera, you don't just throw it away without using it. You use, you, <laughs> you, you, you use yeah. the camera and then you throw it away. Like you use the disposable uh, fork and knife to eat your KFC. And then, and then after you use it, the, the spork gets thrown away, but you got to do something with it before you dispose it. Yep. Yeah. That's, it's okay to move on uh, with that stuff. And, you know, Kevin, there might be a point where you're like, yeah, you know, I've drawn 500 potato mustache cartoons. Uh, I want to do something else now, and it may not be drawing at all. Um, there's a point at which I'm not going to have to do anything with my house. Like I'll have all the big stuff done. Uh, well, guess what? I'll do something else. <laughs> you know, so, uh, a lot of these things are disposable and not going to happen all our lives. Well, you channel it somewhere else. Uh, and Jen in the chat uh, says that ideas and talent are the most abundant substances on the planet. It is absolutely true. Um, it can be high art talent. It can be moving rocks. Uh, it's all it's all doing something and it's all uh, having an idea and using a little bit of talent to execute that idea. Uh, there's yeah, no, but I'm pushing back yeah. on that because that's a little against what my whole point of view on this is. Have you considered that you're wrong? Y no. Have you? <laughs> no. I would like you to explain to me how I'm wrong. My perspective okay. Okay. on this is that not a lot of people do have ideas and talent. And if you do, you have to do something with oh, it. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. Most no, people no, no, no. don't that have ideas with. or a whole lot of talent. I'm sorry. Like that's. Yes. mean to say but they don't and that's okay yeah. it doesn't mean they're a bad person it doesn't mean that they couldn't be like the most generous person or like the kindest person or like the type right. of person you want like holding your hand on your deathbed like there are a million other sure. probably more valuable ways to live your life than coming up with ideas for cartoons or short films or whatever so I'm not making a value judgment about one being better than the other, but the fact is there are not a lot of people who are able to come up with like really funny jokes. Right. There just aren't. Yeah. <laughs> there there are, very no. few people can do that. Especially more than one. <laughs> you know, like somebody like a Jose who can make a living out of being funny day after day. And his cartoons yeah, are getting funnier. I don't know if you uh, uh, yeah. have followed him on, on uh, Instagram, but if you follow, check out Jose Arroyo's Instagram. He's posting his uh, like one like single panel New Yorker style cartoons. He's hitting his stride lately. It's been like banger after banger after banger. Been really good ones. But yeah, Jose Arroyo is a rare person. There's, they're not a dime a dozen. Yeah, and it would be it would be a shame if he were doing something that did not employ 
that talent at all. I, I want to make a distinction because I think it will clear up uh, your gripe, Kevin, because I've, I've been kind of imprecise with the stuff that I was talking about. And I, I can see why why you would push back and, and disagree with that. And I do, too. Uh, it made me realize it's almost some people will will understand this if you're into sci-fi and fantasy type things. This distinction between high fantasy and low fantasy. It is not a value judgment that like high fantasy is not awesome and low fantasy fantasy is just kind of good. No, it's about uh, the the level of intricacy uh, that goes into the two types of stories. So there's not any kind of value judgment there, but. I feel like, Kevin, what you're saying is very few people, uh, if we apply that same thing to creativity, let's say high creativity and uh, low creativity, Ben points out hard and soft sci-fi. Yeah, there's always you know, two classes of things. Um, uh, the stuff, a lot of the stuff I'm talking about is, is like low creativity, where it's, it's simple stuff. And you're saying that if, if, if somebody can dabble in to the high creativity they really have an obligation to do that thing. And I'm saying if you don't have high creativity, then find <laughs> a way to play around in the low creativity world uh, and do something with it. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. The number of people who are in that high creativity sphere. And if you had to put a percentage on it, what do you think it is? <sighs> I be, don't know. Be honest. Be real. It, don't don't worry about anybody listening feeling bad that they're not in the X percentile. Let's let's come up with an honest number here. Um, um I, I would say less than five percent for sure. I was going to say five percent. I do not think it's higher than that. Okay, then we can agree on that being at least a cutoff because I think it's lower yeah. than that. I definitely don't think it's higher than five percent. I've just met very. Yeah. I've met a lot of people in my life. I've lived all over the country. I've had a lot of different jobs. I have not met a lot of people who I would classify as highly creative, like just able to bang out novel and useful ideas. Mm -hmm. Just like it's nothing, like they're breathing air. It's just natural. They don't even have to work at it. it. Just It's like a fountain and it's always on and it's always coming out. I mean, that's what I was trying to come up with the analogy with basketball, where it's like a lot of people could play basketball. Barely any of them can dunk. Sure. Yeah. Like there's a difference. Mm -hmm. And like, if you can dunk, you should be dunking. <laughs> like that's, <laughs> it's freaking it, awesome that's right. that you can dunk. It's such a waste of insane talent of dunking a basketball to not dunk. Mm -hmm. As you're talking about the limited number of people who are super highly creative, I think about how few people can just tell a story well. It's not a story that they've invented. I mean, relaying a story. Very few people can tell a good story. Well, if that's the case, then really few people can invent a story. Yeah. Uh, and that really rams it home for me where it's like, yeah, it's, it's a really uncommon thing. So um, uh, last one here is from Charles Kahn, who is a bit of a storyteller himself through memes on Twitter. He's fantastic. One of the best follows on the site. Uh, and also uh, the Real Weird Sicko, Real Weird Sicko's podcast with uh, Dojangles. Um, his question is, With uh, will Kevin's return to cartoon strips push him to try doing some animation? You've tried marijuana, now you should try cocaine. <laughs> I did animation. They were terrible. But I, that's, that's the first thing really? that I, that's the first oh, thing well, I, yeah. I did on YouTube was animation. That's right. Yeah. That's how I got into it. So my natural progression was doing comic strips and then YouTube came along and I was like, oh, videos. So I did animation and there was a time where that's what I actually wanted to do full time. It's one of the reasons I love Psychic Pebbles so much because deep down I always wanted to be an animator and- uh, You want to slay him and wear his skin. Yeah, he's-, he's Somebody notices. He's the best. He is the best. He's the best. <laughs> I really admire what he does and, and love his cartoons because uh, I, I love animation. I love cartoons. So I, I did do this, do this for a while, but uh, it was at a time where I was using a program called Macromedia Director to do it because it was the only wow. program that I know, knew how to use and it was absolutely horrible and it was terrible for animation. And um, it's Adobe Director now. I don't even think that they have well, director it's been anymore. Yeah. yeah, the whole thing's like F final release was 2013, but <laughs> yeah, dude, it's like long done. <laughs> Macromedia itself—that's that, a blast from the past. 
yeah, and I just got discouraged that that program sucked, and I just never knew. I never learned another program. I just moved on to doing video instead of animation. But I'm a big fan of that. But I don't know. I don't think I'll go back to that. I'd have to pay somebody. Maybe I could come up with a script idea or something, and then I don't know. Pay one of Meat Canyon's underlings to animate it for me. But I'm not. I'm not sitting there drawing the thing. I don't think. I don't think by hand. That's not in the cards for me at this point. For now, I'll just doodle things and put it on Instagram and and be pleased with that and be glad that I'm doing that again. Regret that I took so much time away from it. Again, even though it's not the most important thing in the world, um, it's something I should have been doing. So, hey, we got a late one from Andy. Uh, do does the lighting, does like the the purple and blue lighting, help with your creativity, Kevin? Oh no, it helps with my eyes. So. My eyes hurt like all the time from staring at computer screens all day for 12 years. So I have like muted and colored lighting. This is, is I love when something pops up where, where Kevin and I are like polar opposites on things. And I love like as close as you can get to, to the sun level of bright lighting. I hate more than anything shadows and being in my own light. So if I can if I can, you know, have one of those, oh, is that a flash from an A-bomb five miles away levels of, of lighting in a room? Uh, <laughs> yeah, if I can have like shockingly bright light, uh, that that helps me function and and do work and be creative and all of that. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's funny. We agree on so many things. And then there's this like handful of things that we are complete opposite on. And that's one of them. I like to be in a <laughs> it's total opposites. Yeah. A cavern while I work, uh, a dark, dank, a coom cave, if you cavern. will. <laughs> yeah, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, all right. I think that's it. I think that that I hope that I explained that well enough. If I, if I didn't, then please leave a comment and let me know where I, where I got it wrong. But that's, that's sort of what I've been thinking about lately as it relates to highly creative people that have ideas. If you have ideas, you need to do something with them. Just don't let them be forgotten by yourself. Even if, even if like you do do it for yourself just so you can remember them or you do it to make a handful of other people happy. Either way, that's a good thing and you should be doing that. So Rule for life number three. I've I've enjoyed how this is going. I think it's your turn next, Matt. So you better start conjuring up your own. It is rule for life to etch into this these tablets, these stone tablets that we're crafting week after week. That's right. But um, you're gonna have to wait to the next one. That's this one. Uh, if you are highly creative, then you have an obligation to do something with it. And if you want to twist that off into uh, a non highly creative rule, then whatever it is that you find yourself uniquely good at, whether it's like helping old ladies cross the street or stocking groceries better than anyone else, whatever it is, friggin' do it. Fan of food storage. Yeah, do it. Yeah. Food storage, organizing old meat. You have an obligation to do that with great power comes great responsibility. Yeah. You've seen the tea shelf, the protein bar shelf, (laughs) the, uh, the snacks shelf. The drinks shelf. It's important. You got to, you got to Jenga those things in properly. Yeah. Yeah. The, the meat freezer. All right. Yeah. All right. Meat freezer, man. Uh, we're out of here. This is a good crowd. Thank you to all of our patrons yes. for hanging out uh, with us on this Tuesday. It was really great to see all of you. I uh, hope to see you again next week. We'll, we will be back until then. We'll see you space cowboys. Thanks for listening to The Create Unknown. We make this show with the support of our patrons. 100% of that goes directly to keeping episodes going every week, and the recent support has been amazing. Sidpoke, NRM, Venture Addicts, Weezer Good, you all really do make this show happen. Thank you to the Tots and Dumpster crew, old and new, who save tiny little lives every month. Thank you to our grizzled, battle-hardened child infantry. Clemente De Los Santos, Dan the Latch, Demetrius Andrews, Erica, Farrakhan, Jen Mefasanti, Kevin Menard, Mikhail Steinke, Monahim, Natsu, Penny Peddler, Risebread, Ryan Kinder, Samuel Manser, Sean S., Sean Malone, and Tom Bidioger. And a tremendous shout out to our elite baby gang commanders. Atrocious Guff, Cat, Dojangles, Graham Robertson, James Gallagher, Jeff Davis, Orange Vanilla Coke, Patrick Pister, TCU's personal pilot, Andy, Ryan Carroll, Baseweight, Vinthos, Yetus Deletus, Jonas Walter, 
Nathan Robinson, Chelksies, and of course, Trevstead. You are the elite. Thank you as well to our indentured servants, producer-editor Ben Webster, Minecraft mogul Laterman, Discord kitten wrangler Conrad, and producer emeritus Dan Yoshua. Thanks to Baseweight for use of Created in the Unknown for the opening theme. Thanks to Electro Voice for giving us mics to sound good on top of it. And a special thanks to Main Gear for powering all of our PC endeavors. The Create Unknown is an unknown media production in partnership with Studio 71. 